I to hit the record button. Thank you. All right, hello, good morning, and welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have you here um, to learn more about the Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness. Uh, the session is being recorded and we will send this out um, as well as um, putting this on our website and we'll send out the slides as well, of course, and we'll post those on our website as well. So all of this can be accessible to you after the fact. Um, so I'm Caitlin O'Brien. I am the Director of Learning and Community Impact at the Scattergood Foundation and have been working with the Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness since its inception in 2017. And I am going to pass it over to my colleague, Bridget Talone, uh, who will introduce herself. Thanks, Caitlin. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Bridget Talone. I'm the Grants Manager for Learning and Community Impact, um, and I'm happy to be joining this info session today. I'll I'll be monitoring the chat. If people have questions, I'll try and elevate those. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to uh, get started. We did review some of the questions that came in. Um, second um that came in uh in the registration so um hopefully most of those questions will be answered throughout this presentation um and um we will you know make sure that everybody is feels like they have what they need in order to apply so um once again, uh, my name Kate, is Caitlin O'Brien. I'm the Director of Learning and Community Impact at the Scattergood Foundation. And thank you all so much for joining to learn more about the application for the Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness. So today um, we are going to do a bit of background and overview of the Community Fund and um, talk a little bit about the fifth cycle of grant making and um, we'll you know, go over some of the eligibility criteria, what the process looks like, talk about the selection criteria, um, talk about how to apply and um, really, and we can go through the found and grant portal a little bit. Um, and then we will also, you know, of course, leave space for questions. Feel free to add questions to the chat um, as we're you know, going throughout this process and Bridget will monitor the chat so that we are making sure we're answering all your questions. Um, this is not the only time and space for questions. If you all have questions that come up as you're completing the application um, or wanna talk through your eligibility um, or any other questions about the program that you'd be applying for, please feel free to reach out to myself and or Bridget. We're more than happy to uh, talk to folks and learn a little bit more about their organizations and what they're planning on doing. So a little background and overview. Uh, the Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness is a participatory grant making initiative. So what that means is that um, we really are putting the voice of uh, people who would be impacted by how these dollars get spent at the center of the work. Um, so you can see here, these are sort of different levels of participation in grant making. Um, informing is where sort of grant makers tell and they put out a request for proposals. This is what we wanna see happen in your community. And non-grant makers, folks who are doing the work on the ground really receive that, uh, complete an application and, um, and, and sort of go the way that the grant makers are wanting to go. Um, that's a much more traditional philanthropic approach. There's uh, some approaches in the middle there. And what we're really working to get to is that blue box on the end there, which is deciding, which is really two-way communication that leads to, uh, you know, really collaborative decision-making. And um, this happens at the pre-grant stage, at the, um, in the granting process and in the post-grant stage. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we move forward. So this is kind of what our model looks like. Um, we have a pooled fund that is made up of uh, funds from several different funders, uh, including the Scattergood Foundation, the Patricia Kind Family Foundation, the Dowdy Foundation, and the City of Philadelphia's uh, Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. Um, you know, if you all are in uh, relationship with funders that would want to 
give even more to our pooled fund, we are are still accepting, um, you know, funds for that pool. Um, we work closely with a community advisory group that has worked with us since 2017 to build our grant making strategy, request for proposals, has had input on uh, who is in our granting group, and um, you know really drives the strategy around what this work looks like. Um, we then have a decision making body, and so that is our granting group, which. Um, is facilitated by the Scattergood Foundation, but is not uh, the Scattergood Foundation staff and board, as is typical with more traditional philanthropy, but is really, um, you know, folks that have lived experience, are first or second generation immigrants, and can really speak to the needs of uh, their particular community and how organizations are serving, uh, serving their community. We then work closely with our grantee programs, um, you know, provide funding and support and, um, and um, you know, also have worked with a community of practice to uh, build relationships among grantee cohorts and, um, and, you know, sort of learn and develop new practices. Um, all right, what's next? All right, so the goals of the community fund. So these are really our overarching goals. So first is to invest in programs that remove barriers and provide opportunities to individuals, especially vulnerable communities to live with dignity and joy um, and really to uh, sort of uphold the humanity of um, you know folks who are, I'm sorry about these slides. Um, it's a little uh, very touchy. Um, so, um, that is really one of the, the, probably the core goal of the fund. We are also hoping to build organizational capacity among immigrant serving organizations and particularly grassroots organizations. We aim to create space for engagement and collaboration through peer learning network of community-based organizations that serve immigrants and refugees and really giving space for organizations to share, learn from one another and uh, to connect on work that is often challenging and you know, emotional. So um, you know, really giving folks that safe space to, to talk about the work. And then finally, centering the grantee and community voices throughout a participatory process. So as I mentioned, we have a pooled fund uh, that currently consists of the Scattergood Foundation, City of Philadelphia, Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities, and the Dowdy Foundation and the Patricia Kind Family Foundation. I also really wanna thank our community advisory board, which is made up of community-based organizations that serve immigrants and refugees throughout greater Philadelphia and um, all touch different areas of health and wellness. Um, so those organizations include ACANA, AFAJO, La Porta Abierta, Highest PA, Nationality Service Center, Puentes de Salud, and CMAC, and the Welcoming Center. So really, uh, my deepest thanks to those organizations that have you know, spent a, a great deal of hours, um, you know, working to pull together our requests for proposals, learn and grow as the fund learn, learns and grows and, um, you know, really build something that I think has has become a, a special grant program. So one of the things that we did uh, relatively early on in our process of the Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness was create a definition of behavioral health. Um, this is pulled from definitions from the World Health Organization, um, mentalhealth.gov, the World Psychiatric Association, and really trying to define behavioral health by what it means to have mental health rather than uh, the absence of mental illness. So behavioral health is a dynamic state of well-being, which enables individuals to use their abilities in harmony with societal values. Important components of mental health include an individual's ability to recognize, express, and manage emotions, cope with the normal stresses of life, relate to others and function in social roles, maintain a healthy relationship to addictive sub substances, um, make a contribution to the community, and realize their own potential. 
So what that has looked like and has been operationalized in some of the core goals of what uh, the Community Fund Advisory Board really wants to see in the programs that uh, we are funding is that the programs encourage care and positive coping, coping strategies and collective healing, that they cultivate meaningful social connections and networks, that they foster dignity and self-agency, that they center cultural approaches to emotional health. And then of course, uh, throughout everything we do, we're really uh, working to build collaboration and capacity. So in our fifth cycle of grant making, um, this actually looks fairly similar to our fourth cycle and organizations, all organizations are of any, of any size up to uh, 10 million uh, annual budgets of $10 million are eligible to apply for up to $50,000 in funding. Grants are for one year and um, Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness Grants can be used to support the organization's programs related to uh, those core goals that I just mentioned. Um, the Community Fund also aims to support organizations that use emergent community-driven approaches for promoting emotional health and well-being. So uh, just one thing that I really see often in working with our granting groups is that organizations that are really working deeply with their community to build leadership within their um, the communities that they work with, the uh, participants that they work with, that their programming is really led and driven by those needs and that they have those deep relationships. Those organizations are really rising to the top and tend to get funding, um, that that really has been a core element of the uh, selection process for community granting groups. So as you're thinking about your application, um, you know, really think about, I know many, if not all of the organizations on, that, on this call are doing that. And, you know, really think about how you're bringing that to life in your application. So for eligibility criteria of the fund, um, we do require that organizations be a nonprofit or have a fiscal sponsor. Um, organizations must serve uh, either Philadelphia County or the surrounding four counties, including Bucks, Chester County, Delaware County, or Montgomery County. Um, the organization must have an annual budget of $10 million or less. And we did receive a few questions about this. So um, one thing that uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about, I know there's often, especially within university systems, there might be smaller programs within university systems um, that have annual budgets of $10 million or less, but the university does not have it has a, an annual budget of much larger than that. Um, unfortunately, those organizations are not eligible for these funds. Our, um, our really our core goal here is to support organizations that don't often see the kind of funding um, that, that uh, organizations that have more resources tend to, tend to receive. So, um, you know, we, our community advisory board has, you know, had a lot of conversations about uh, how we are really intentional about that and including an eligibility requirement around annual, annual budget size uh, was one way that we wanted to, you know, really put forth that, that this fund is for, uh, you know, more grassroots and community-based organizations. Um, that don't necessarily to have those ties to uh, very significant resources like universities and hospital systems often do. Um, so the organization's mission is to work with immigrant and, ref and or refugee communities. Um, we also have, have gotten some questions about this and you know, there's been questions about this kind of throughout the time that we've, we've included this eligibility criteria. Um, and our community advisory board has had um, a lot of uh, really thoughtful conversations about this particular eligibility criteria and, um, you know, has felt that organizations where their core mission is really to serve immigrants and refugees, um, putting the, you know, putting cultural needs really at the center of the work is so critically important. Um, and especially to work in the emotional health and wellness space that, um, you know, this funds goal is is really to put that piece at the center. So um, by by 
you know, putting this eligibility requirement in place, it's really uh, about supporting organizations that are putting culture, uh, cultural needs, cult, um, and, uh, you know, centering the cultural practices really at the center of the work. Um, and then finally, um, representative leadership, our granting group will really take a look at sort of how the leadership of the organization is representative of the community that they serve and, um, you know, working to build that leadership and board that reflects that community. So we have two different applications this cycle. So we have one for new applicants um, and that consists of um, organizations that may have received grant funding in the past, but does not have a grant for the current cycle. Um, and if you have any questions about that, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, but that this is really a, a fuller application that goes through a community, uh, a section on community where uh, organizations are describing their community and how they build trust and power, um, you know, looks into um, a deeper grant request with more of an organization description, how they align with the community fund, what they are requesting the funding for, um, and the uh, budget for for the you know uh, amount requested, and um, you know a number of other question key questions there. Uh, we also have um, because we build a community of practice, we do have a section where we would like to better understand from applicants what um, their needs would be from a community of practice uh, and what their capacity building needs so that we can kind of plan for the future. Um, and then, of course, any additional information that uh, the organization would like to share with us. So for new applicants, you can apply for up to $50,000. And again, um, for new applicants, it might you might have been a grantee in cycles one through three, um, and we ask that you complete this this new applicant uh, application. For applicants that were um, that are current grantees, so grantees of cycle four, um, we have a, a an application that is um, slightly shorter and that uh, you know would really be about sort of how your program is going, any key learnings, um, and then what you are requesting for the future. So in terms of timeline, we opened the application um, a couple weeks ago in February. Of course, today is our virtual information session. Um, then our application period closes on Wednesday, April 3rd at 5 p.m. Um, I highly recommend getting into the grant portal kind of as early as you can, even just to look around and make sure that sort of you can pull all the elements of the application together. Um, and we also know that organizations are are busy and, um, you know, that we will likely get applications in, uh, most of them on April 3rd, but please go in there, take a look around so you can ask any questions or reach out to myself or Bridget, um, you know, before the deadline when we're, we'll likely to get a lot of questions and may not have quite as much of the time and capacity to be able to, you know, have those thoughtful conversations. And we really do welcome uh, you all reaching out. So we will do uh, in the spring some due diligence and application review. Um, and then in June, organizations can expect to hear back um, about their grant award status. And we will uh, be contracting with applicants um, and uh, paying out grants and then for a grant period um, from July to June of next year. Um, so for our selection criteria, so a little bit about our selection process. We, as I mentioned earlier, we work with a granting group that reviews applications and makes grant decisions. Um, it is an eligibility requirement that those individuals have lived experience as a first or second generation immigrant. So they are bringing that lived experience to the work. Um, they must be nominated by a community advisory board member and selected through a 
brief application process um, where we're, we're really trying to get a sense of, uh, you know, folks' perspectives and their background so that we're building a diverse uh, group of, of members. Um, Grange Group members participate in an onboarding session with the Scattergood Foundation. They conduct individual review of applications and um, participate in a series of discussion sessions to ultimately select grantees. And I see some questions in the chat. I will answer them in just a moment. So thank you so much. Um, in terms of selection criteria, the uh, granting group is going to be asked to look at how the organization engages their community, how representative their leadership and board is of the communities that they serve, how they build trust and power, um, how they integrate community voice into their work, um, quality and clarity of the grant application. So, you know, thinking about what is their plan for, for implementation, um, does their funding request uh, and budget really support the work that they are uh, uh, proposing? Um, and how does the organization really support their staff's wellness and leadership, especially in um, organizations and work that is, um, you know, focused on emotional health and, and wellness, making sure that organizations are really supporting their staff? Um, how aligned the organization is with the community fund? And, uh, you know, we'll also look at the potential for positive community impact and how uh, the work can sort of contribute to the broader field of uh, working with immigrant and refugee communities around emotional health and well-being. Um, one other thing that the group does look at is uh, the diversity of the cohort, both sort of across geographic locations um, in the, we know that the immigrant communities in uh, the greater Philadelphia area are incredibly diverse um, and wanting to make sure that the cohort is um, as representative as possible uh, of, of the great diversity of the immigrant community in greater Philadelphia and that um, their, you know, organizations are serving uh, communities that have, uh, have needs in this space. All right, so I'm going to, you guys have listened to me talk for uh, enough time. I just want to answer a couple questions. Um, if organizations have applied in the past um, and did not receive funding, they would apply to the new applicant um, uh, application. We have uh, currently, we have 11 uh, organizations that are current grantees, so it would just be the 11 current grantees that would use the current grantee application. Um, but every, every other organization should use that new applicant application. Um, and then Andrew, I see your question. Um, what application form for current grantee planning additional new services to expand the format of the program? That's a great question. So even if you're a current grantee, um, there is space for you to talk about sort of what you learned from the previous year and talk about um, sort of how you plan to expand or shift based on those learnings and, um, and uh, you know, continue to build your program. So is that, does that, is that helpful? Uh, should it be uh, fit in the application uh, whole explanation part and uh, how like the format because it's, I might talk a lot you know uh, um, it's supposed to be a couple like just in short or it's uh, have to be full de description um I mean it should be you know a, 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 a detailed description enough so that there are granting group can really get a sense of mm -hmm. what it is that you're uh, your organization is wanting to do. Um, and I think, so there is, there will be a space. So the funding request is really sort of to get a sense of what your organization is specifically requesting the funding for. And that is where I would include um, sort of a deeper description of, I mean, you'll have a spot where you talk about the program learnings, what you've learned. Um, and then that is really where you can describe sort of what the plan is for the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Um, so Lusana, I'm seeing your question. Um, 
I think maybe we should have a, a conversation about sort of, um, you know, that at Summer Search, your, your organization, the mission is to create greater equity and expand pathways for students of color in low-income communities. Um, and that, um, you know, many of the students you serve, I, I, I'm happy to have a, a sort of more one-on-one -on -one conversation to answer that question. It's, it's possible that you may not uh, be eligible simply because really sort of placing um, the immigrant experience really central to the work is really where uh, this funds approach lies. So, but I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to learn a little bit more about your program. Yep, and I, and yes, uh, community advisory board organizations are eligible to apply. So folks who are on the granting group, if they are on the staff or board of an organization, those folks are not eligible to apply, but community advisory board organizations are eligible. And um, you know we've seen community advisory board organizations both receive grants and not receive grants. So it's it's been a little bit across the board. Um, and hi, Erica. Um, there, so organizations, or so grants can um, either uh, prioritize new programs or programs that are already in place. I think I would think about sort of what would be best suited for this opportunity. Um, and I also see a request for our email addresses. So I will drop mine in the chat. And all of our information is also on our website. Um, I will drop the um, web page that is specifically for the community fund in the chat as well. And Bridget also included her email address. So I'm gonna take just one other, so up to Sharon, hi, uh, nice to have you here. What would be the lowest amount? Is it dependent on the revenue of the organizations or projects? So um, the um, you can apply for what is needed. Um, if your organization feels that what is needed is a $5,000 grant, um, by all means, you can apply for a $5,000 grant. It's really truly up to $50,000. Um, and it is not based on the revenue of the organization. Um, I think being thoughtful about sort of how organizations spend money and, um, you know, sort of what the plan in place is for spending down those dollars within the grant year, um, you know, is an important uh, thing to think about. Um, and we, um, uh, but at the same time, you know, if you, your organization is uh, an organization with an annual budget that is, uh, you know, maybe it, it's in the $50,000 range, if you're also up to, you know, welcome to uh, apply for the full $50,000. And one of the reasons our community advisory board described or, um, you know, really decided that is that, you know, organizations that are, uh, have smaller annual budgets are also are often doing that work on uh, a volunteer basis and you know wanting to make sure that organizations that might have a smaller revenue get the opportunity to think bigger um, and that you know they're not being capped by um, by the requirement of having a specific organization size to um, to apply for that larger grant. Thank you, Ellie, for including your information about bike rides. That's wonderful. Um, and I'm just going to take a quick moment just to share my screen and um, show you the grant portal. So um, if you go to our website, you'll click on support participatory funds. And then you'll see here we have our community fund for immigrant wellness page. You'll see a full overview. Um, if there's a lot of great information. I highly recommend looking through the full request for proposals. Um, much of the information that I described here today is in this full request. Um, we will also post, ooh, sorry, folks, um, the informational session video and slides here on the page. 
and then you can click apply in a couple of different places. So uh, there is a, an apply button here in the overview, apply on this tab down below, and then also you can apply now here. So you can go to the Found and Grant Portal. You'll see the Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness um, applications here. Um, you'll see two different applications. There's the application for current grantees and the application for new applicants. So just make sure that you are clicking on the correct application. Um, there are also a couple of other opportunities. Um, I'm happy to talk about those as well if, if you all want to reach out. Um, I think we did receive uh, a question too about whether or not organizations, if they were applying to the Kensington Community Resilience Fund, if they could also apply to this fund and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, so, so just uh, to answer that question from the registration. Um, you can click log on or create account to apply. This will take you to a log on page. If you already have um, an account, feel free to include your email address and password and simply log on. If you've forgotten your password, you can click this convenient forgot your password button um, or you're more than welcome to reach out to myself or Bridget and we can help reset your, um, your account or you can click create new account and it will direct you to a page where you include information about your organization, um, your individual user information, uh, information about your executive officer and we'll create a password. And then you can go from there. Um, just to go back, I log on, take my role to applicant because, um, and you can see here, I can go to the apply page and click here to apply. You'll see that once you've created a, an account, you'll be able to, to click there to apply. And, um, and you can complete the application right here in the portal. Um, and if you scroll down, you can save the application uh, or submit. Um, and you know if you all are, writing your application out in like Google Docs or in uh, a Word document, please just make sure you're being cognizant of the character limits. Um, and and so, uh, so you have that in mind as you're, if you're completing it elsewhere. Um, I'm going to stop my share, just see if there are any, any other questions. Can so we ask? Uh, so, so, right. So, yeah, you you can feel free to ask. I'm going to just answer this quick question in uh, the chat from Krista. Um, hi, Krista. Um, no, the uh, organization does not have to address all aspects of the definition of behavioral health. Um, what it should address all of are those uh, sort of core program goals. So encouraging um positive coping strategies, collective healing, um, uh, you know, building dignity and self-agency, building meaningful connections and social networks, um, and um, the, apologies, the final one, um, uh, centering cultural approaches to emotional health. Absolutely. And Alice Gall? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is yeah. Alaska Wisner. I work for the Minority Center. And uh, I, I'm happy to be here. Um, we have been struggling. We have an immigrant pro proposal for schools. And we even met with some school districts to benefit. Our, they started, they said the proposal was good, but they didn't have funding. We started going to different, different groups. So first, uh, my question is, to be as a new person, do I have to be nominated by the advisory board to, to before I can put an application together? Do I have to be nominated before writing an application? From you do not have board? to be nom you do not have to be nominated in order to write an application for the fund. The only thing that you have to be nominated for um, is for our granting group. Um, to participate in the review and evaluation of applications, but no, you do not need to be nominated. You can, this is an open application. 
The second question is that can it be school based? Can we also provide services in schools? Yes, one hundred percent. We funded we funded a good number of organizations that are providing services in schools. Absolutely. Yes, that, that, I'm very I'm very impressed with this because we have our immigrant mentorship program for schools, and we've been struggling to get to get it from there. And but well, anyway, I'm happy to hear this, and I will take advantage of this. Wonderful. Yeah, and please feel free to reach out if you want to talk further. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? I feel like I should be playing Jeopardy music. <laughs> We, okay. yes, I see. Oh, yeah. Okay, a couple questions coming in, coming in. All right, here we go. Um, so do we fund legal services? Yes, absolutely we do. Um, we we rep recognize that legal services and, um, you know, working with folks uh, around their legal status is a really important part of mental health, a foundational part of mental health. I think one thing that um, I have seen, just a tip from, from me to you and working with grant groups is that Often uh, the legal services that uh, get funded typically um, are ones that uh, talk about sort of the way in which organizations are interacting with their clients and that uh, there is, uh, you know, often some level of uh, trauma-informed practice that has been integrated um, and that there is a, a strong sort of attention to the emotional health and well-being of the, the folks that are being served. So yes, absolutely. And just sort of a, a a tip on sort of how to how to think about it for specifically this application uh, is to think about um, talking about the individual interactions with or with with uh, clients and communities. Um, no, we did not uh, cover reporting requirements. Um, so one of the things that we uh, one of the participatory elements too is also you know, we've had, we've built a community of practice for our grantees and, um, you know, also want to work with organizations sort of around what they want to share about the work. We uh, typically do have a, an end of the year kind of culminate, culminating activity. Um, I would say the, the reporting requirements are not particularly stringent and we will work with grantees um, around sort of what makes most sense for them and uh, for really the goal of the reporting is like sharing and learning. Um, and, you know, we will have some, some level of financial reporting just, which is likely just have, you know, sort of have you spent down the grant funds. Um, but it is really, our hope is really to have it be more around sharing and learning um, than uh, sort of very strict uh, metrics around reporting. All right, see a thumbs up, wonderful. Anything else? Um, I have a question if I may, and apologies, I didn't raise my hand, and sorry, uh, without video, of I'm in transition. <laughs> um, uh, I have a question about um, eligibility criteria. I apologize if this wasn't uh, the presentation. Again, I had to join late. Um, does the organization have to be focused solely on working with um, the immigrant community, or could it have other, um, you know, communities of interest, such as, you know, unhoused individuals, et cetera, which partly intersect, but not altogether? Yeah, so really the core of, of this opportunity is really to serve immigrant and refugee communities. And because the work is really focused on um, centering, putting the culture at the center of the work, uh, the answer is yes, we do. We do our eligibility requirements state that we, um, the organization has to be pretty squarely focused on serving immigrants and refugees. 
Right. But, but my question is, you know, it, it is, but there are other arms. Would that make the organization ineligible? And I'm, I'm, and just to clarify, I might have lost you. I think I might have lost you. I'm so sorry. I was uh, switching no to another. I was switching to another um, network. And let's see if I can do my video. <laughs> um, it, yeah. So my question, my question was, and and thank you for. Um, making the time for it. Um, if if the organization if the organization's focus is primarily on immigrants, but it just does other work as well, so that you know that community, that immigrant community, can also exist and benefit. I mean, it definitely um, it definitely certain uh, sounds like it. You know, it's definitely possible, um, and mm -hmm. I'm happy to sort of learn a little bit more. I know we've we've also I I also owe you an email. Um, but yes, no worries, um, no worries. No, well, I appreciate um, it. Yeah, yeah. Let's just talk a little bit more. Sounds great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, yeah. Kathy. All right, folks. Well, I mean, I'm also, I'm happy to kind of stay on if folks have questions, but um, I'm also happy to to let folks go and, um, you know, have, have folks get 15 minutes back um, and to take a, hopefully a break uh, more than anything. But um, thank you all so, so much for your time and uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. We love having these conversations with organizations and getting to know you a little bit better um, and putting faces to names. So uh, really, um, really thank you so much for spending your time with us and really looking forward to seeing your applications.